medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. And folks, this is going to be a very special update, one that I'm really excited about because of some new information that has come out. We've done 150 plus videos at MedCram over the last almost three years on COVID-19. And this, more than any other, is going to put pieces together that's going to make it click. And I think if there's a video that you want to share and watch to the end, this is the video that you want to do it in. So I'm going to front load this, especially for those that aren't familiar with with what we've done here at medcram.com. But if this is new to you, I really encourage you to go through the whole video because the information here is going to be very interesting, very impressive. And I think it's going to connect a lot of dots for you. So if you don't know who I am or MedCram, I am Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm a quadruple board certified intensivist in internal medicine, pulmonary diseases, critical care medicine, and sleep medicine. I'm on the faculty at two Southern California medical schools. I and Kyle Allred, the co-founder of MedCram.com, are the producer of multiple continuing medical education lectures used in the medical, PA, and respiratory schools, both here in the United States and also internationally. I've authored and published scientific papers. Our continuing medical education videos are actually used by major publishers to educate healthcare providers. We at MedCram were awarded the Medical Merit Medal by the Crown Prince of Bahrain for our work in COVID-19 policy. And we treat patients at two Southern California hospitals. I work in the intensive care unit, taking care of ICU patients, intubated them, treated them. And it's been my passion to find a solution to this COVID-19 problem. And that is why I'm so excited about what I'm about to show to you. So let's jump to that right away here. This is a paper that was published in a very prestigious journal with an impact factor of 6.2, which puts it in the top 5% of journals called the Journal of Photochemistry and Photobiology. And the title of this paper is Cardiopulmonary and Hematological Effects of Infrared LED Photobiomodulation in the Treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Basically what they're doing here is they are irradiating patients in the hospital with COVID-19 with light, specifically infrared light. And I'll show you how they did this in the study. This is a randomized control trial. So that's one of the most important things. This is not a case control study. This is a randomized controlled trial, which eliminates a lot of confounders. This is the device here that they used. Basically 300 infrared LED lights that emit in the near infrared spectrum. So you cannot see this light. It's invisible to the naked eye, but it's being transmitted as you can see there to the chest area. Let's get a little bit more in the detail. So this is 300 infrared LEDs emitting specifically at 940 nanometers wavelength. This is outside of the visible spectrum. Each one of these LEDs emits at two hundredths of a watt. The total optical power of all of them put together was only six watts. And the average power density was 2.9 milliwatts per square centimeter. So a square centimeter is about the size of your index finger, fingernail. And the amount of power in that area was 29 ten thousandths of a watt. So pretty low powered. The total vest size was about 2,000 square centimeters. And they did it for about 15 minutes every day for about seven days. Now, just to show you where this is, here we're looking at the solar spectrum. And about 40% of the light coming from the sun is in the visible spectrum, which covers this area here. Obviously, we know about ultraviolet light, which is about 7% of the power coming from the sun. But the majority of the power coming from the sun, we can't even see. It's in the near infrared or infrared spectrum. And specifically, the area that we're talking about with this vest is right here at about 940 nanometers. When you have a longer wavelength, it's going to be able to penetrate. And so near infrared radiation, we know, can penetrate into the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue, depending on the wavelength. So that's the reason why they would be shining light onto a portion of the body that you may not think would actually benefit from that. Just to give you a little bit more information, here is the solar spectrum in terms of the amount of power and the amount of spectral irradiance in the specific areas based on wavelength. And you can see here 940 is smack dab here in the middle of the near infrared spectrum, but well out of any visible. So you're not going to see this light at all. It's going to feel like it's warmth, but you're not going to see it. And I'm not even sure at this power whether or not the subject in the study would actually feel it. Depending on the wavelength of the light, the longer the wavelength towards this end and specifically near infrared, which is where this 940 nanometers would be, it's going to be here and it's going to be penetrating deep past the subcutaneous layers, perhaps even into the lungs. There's some data that was published by Zimmerman and Ryder in Melatonin Research that shows that near-infrared light can penetrate up to 8 centimeters into the human body. 
that certainly in non-obese subjects would be well into their lungs and well into the subcutaneous tissue. In fact, if you look at the cells of the human body as you get older, as you can see here, there's age here on the x-axis. Black is representing the total number of cells in the human body, and red here is representing the total number of cells that would be exposed to external sources of near-infrared radiation. You can see that that's quite a number of cells of the human body that could get some exposure to near-infrared radiation. So now you understand where they're coming from. They're wondering whether or not near-infrared radiation would help in COVID-19. For those of you who have never heard of this, you may think that this is a crazy experiment, but for those of you who have been following us on MedCram, you'll know exactly where we're going on this because we know that COVID-19 has an issue with oxidative stress and that near-infrared radiation may actually modulate oxidative stress potentially through the process of production of melatonin. So let's dive into the study. So this was a prospective, descriptive, single-blinded. Obviously, the patients didn't know which they were getting because they got the jacket on in both cases, but in one case it was turned on, and in the other case it was turned off. It's randomized, and it's a longitudinal trial. There was 30 inpatients. Now, you may think that 30 is not a big number, and you're right. It probably could be a bigger number. But the thing that you have to understand here is that even with 30 patients, as you'll see, there was statistical significance. The effects of this intervention were powerful enough for there to be statistical significance with just 30 patients. So they looked at 30 patients that were diagnosed by PCR with COVID-19, 50 to 80 years of age. They had the COVID-19 diagnosis. Their BMI was less than 30. I think that's important because I believe the more adipose tissue there is, the less likely there is of that near-infrared radiation to hit the majority of the cells. They excluded cancer patients, patients with photosensitivity, and these were patients that were not intubated and they randomized them. The intervention group, known as LED, had near-infrared radiation at 940 nanometers for 15 minutes, plus conventional therapy. That's what they would normally be getting in the treatment group, which, by the way, is identical to what the conventional treatment got, except the jacket was put on, but it was not turned on. And so, really, single-blinded, randomized controlled trial. Let's look at the results. The first thing that we have to do is look at the randomization to make sure it was correct. And there's two groups here. There's the LED and there's the control group. So if you take a look here at the means in terms of the body mass index, they were not statistically different. If we look at the age, they were not statistically different. However, if we look at the pneumonia severity index, known as the PSI, those in the intervention group or the LED group actually were statistically significantly worse. So already we're starting off here with the intervention group having a worse pneumonia than those in the control group. What about the sex of the subjects? You can see here that there was very good randomization. They were evenly distributed on both sides. And then in terms of comorbidities, those that had high blood pressure, those that had chronic kidney disease, those that had diabetes, and those that had heart failure, all of these are comorbidities that we know about. There was no statistical significant difference between these groups. So other than the pneumonia severity index that the patients had when they presented, there appears to have been good randomization. Then what they did next was they actually looked at the factors before they started the treatment and then after they started the treatment, and they decided to see whether or not the treatment group had better improvements than those in the control group. So let's take a look at that. The difference from the beginning to the end in the LED group is known as the delta LED, and those in the control group are known as the delta CON or control. We'll look at the p-values here to look for statistical significance. So first off, if you look in the data, those that started out in the control group had a higher amount of oxygen supplemental needed than those in the Delta LED group. They had lower supplemental oxygen requirements. This is despite the fact that they had a higher pneumonia score. In the cardiopulmonary analysis, the oxygen inflow take, notice that the amount of liters per oxygen per minute reduction in the LED group was only three liters per minute, whereas those in the control group was four liters per minute. So actually a better reduction in the control group than in the LED group. But if you know that for some reason they started out at a higher level, this would make more sense. But you'll notice that in terms of partial oxygen saturation in the LED group, there was a 9% improvement from beginning to end, whereas in the control group, there was only a 2.6% improvement. That was statistically significant. In terms of tidal volume, this is the amount of air that you can breathe in and out when you're resting comfortably. There was a much bigger improvement in the LED group. 
in terms of maximum inspiratory pressure, this is the amount of air that you can suck in, a much better inspiratory flow than in the control group. In terms of maximal expiratory pressure, notice that there was a much bigger improvement. The ability, in other words, to blow in and out was statistically significantly better in the LED group. In terms of respiratory frequency, the faster you're breathing, the more likely you are to fail with your breathing. And so bringing the respiratory rate down is important. We had much better statistically significant improvements in the LED group. When patients come in with COVID-19, their heart rates are usually very fast. We saw a better reduction in heart rates in the LED group. Blood pressures are typically high when patients come in because of the adrenergic responses. We saw a reduction in systolic pressure in the LED group versus the control group. Also saw that in the diastolic pressures as well. Let's go on and take a look here at the hematological analysis. So the blood analysis, again, we have LED and we have control group. Not statistically significant for erythrocytes, those are red blood cells. Not statistically significant for hemoglobin. Notice, by the way, that the diastolic blood pressure was not statistically significant, but the systolic blood pressure was. Hematocrit, not statistically significant. However, notice with leukocytes, those are the white blood cells. Notice that there was a significant reduction in the white blood cells in the LED group than there was in the control group. That means that the amount of white blood cells was reduced. This is usually a good sign. However, lymphocytes we often notice in COVID-19 are very reduced. And these are the specific types of cells that are required to kill the virus. And one of the problems that we have in COVID-19 is that the lymphocytes are very, very low. Well, notice that there was a statistically significant improvement in the lymphocytes in the LED group, whereas a continued worsening in the control group. Monocytes also improved, but not statistically significantly. Again, for the rest of these, there was no statistical significance. One of the things that they noticed is that the patients that were hospitalized in the LED group were in the hospital a full four days less than those in the control group. So let's look at the summary here in the publication. Number one, they found that LED photobiomodulation combined with conventional therapy outcomes versus control enhances the effect of conventional therapy on COVID-19 patients, presenting as a statistically significant improvement in the recovery of the vital cardiopulmonary functions, including partial oxygen saturation, tidal volume, maximum inspiratory pressure, maximum expiratory pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, and systolic blood pressure, as well as hematological components like a reduction in the leukocytes, a reduction in the segmented neutrophils, and an improvement in the lymphocytes. There was also a statistically significant reduction in the time of hospitalization stays, and as it turns out, four days difference, which is huge. The time when adventitious noises improve from the date of the patient's hospital intake is significantly reduced. You can see here that these are the types of sounds that we hear on physical examination. It also presents an improvement in the PSI and the NLCR indices when compared to conventional therapy. Again, this is the pneumonia severity that was improved. And when they looked at the statistical significance and the power of this, the results exceeded 80%, which is very, very powerful. So small study, but very powerful results from LED. What about side effects? No reported side effects or complications associated with LED therapy were observed during treatment and no patients died. Due to the severity of the disease of the patients with COVID-19, the use of LED therapy can improve clinical status and reduce the need for ICU beds and oxygen intake, and consequently, the use of mechanical ventilators. Other potential benefits of LED therapy include that the treatment is an easy, safe, non-invasive, non-pharmacological, painless, and low-cost modality. The results of this study are promising and will stimulate further research to evaluate the direct effect of photobiomodulation on the pulmonary condition of patients with COVID-19. It's worth mentioning that in the present study, the pulmonary function of the groups was evaluated by objective measures, which is relevant because this approach has not been supported so far in the current literature. Among the strengths of the study, it should be noted that it is innovative because employed phototherapy using a vest with an array of 300 LEDs at 940 nanometers in complement to the conventional treatment of COVID-19. Moreover, the photobiomodulation reduced the average hospitalization time by four days and induced a significant improvement in the maximum inspiratory pressure, 32%, and the maximum expiratory pressure, 23%, pulmonary functions. These data are very promising and highlight the systemic effect of photobiomodulation.
The main limitation of the present study was the size of the cohort of patients. Remember, it was 30 patients. A larger participation of patients in the study should increase the strength of the statistical analysis. Other possible items that could be investigated, such as filling out questionnaires by patients, monitoring the process of pulmonary inflammation, testing different doses of LED irradiation and wavelengths, and others were left for future research because the study was developed during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic when the whole effort was to find innovative therapies for better recovery of the patients. So what's really interesting here is that something as simple as light could make such improvements in a disease that was so frustrating and difficult to treat. So the question is, is why would light, specifically near-infrared light, be so beneficial in patients with COVID-19? And for that, we go back to one of our earlier videos that we actually published almost three years ago on May 1st of 2020, looking at oxidative stress. And one of the things that you've got to understand is that angiotensin 2, which is a pro-oxidant in the cells, is converted to angiotensin 1-7, which is an antioxidant. And that process occurs through an enzyme known as ACE2. Well, ACE2, as you know, is the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So again, angiotensin II, which is a pro-oxidant, which is bad, we don't want pro-oxidants, is going to lead to more reactive oxygen species, which are bad. But angiotensin 1-7, which is an antioxidant, is actually going to block or shut down reactive oxygen species, which is good. We want that. The problem happens when you get a viral infection and that viral infection shuts down ACE2. Now what happens is you have a buildup of the bad stuff, angiotensin 2, and a reduction in angiotensin 1-7. That by itself can cause reactive oxygen species, but remember that the virus itself attracts white blood cells and those white blood cells can also add to reactive oxygen species. When these reactive oxygen species accumulate, they can damage the cells in a way that they become damaged and they release something called von Willebrand's factor and release also other procoagulants. And that can lead to blood clots and then finally hypoxemia. That's a lack of oxygen. If we can somehow head off these reactive oxygen species, either with melatonin at night secreted by the pineal gland, or as some research has been suggesting, melatonin through near-infrared radiation from the sun, we can potentially reduce reactive oxygen species. So you may be asking, Roger, well, how do we know that SARS-CoV-2 does its dirty work through oxidative stress? There was this paper that was published in December of 2021 in the journal Antioxidants titled Severe Glutathione Deficiency, Oxidative Stress, Oxidant Damage in Adult Hospitalized with COVID-19. Implications from Glynac, glycine, and N-acetylcysteine supplementation. So here they took 60 patients that were admitted to the hospital, and they measured three different things. They measured reduced glutathione, which is the antioxidants in the cell. They looked at something called TBARS, or T-bars, which is a marker of oxidative stress. And they also looked at F2 isoprostane, which is a marker of oxidative damage. And so when they looked at these subjects across different age groups, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, and 60 years plus, Notice that across the board, with red representing those COVID patients, that there was a smaller amount of reduced glutathione, which are antioxidants. So that's the first clue there that there is something going on. The second thing they looked at was plasma T-bars, which is a measure of oxidative stress. And again, COVID being in red, across the board, patients had higher levels with increasing age, but definitely more than control of oxidative stress. Finally, when they looked at damage as a surrogate with F2 isoprostane, again, COVID in red across the board, higher levels of oxidative damage. High oxidative damage is going to cause destruction of the cell, and that could potentially release von Willebrand's factor. So how is this actually happening? How, in other words, does oxidative stress cause damage to the body and COVID-19? What we can see here is a cross-section of a blood vessel. This could be a blood vessel in the lung particularly. So that's where the virus enters and that's where we would expect to see it. These purple things along the side here are endothelial cells lining both sides of the pulmonary artery. And in the middle here, we have red blood cells that are flowing by and doing what they need to do. So when these endothelial cells become damaged with oxidative stress, they can become damaged and expose below them tissue that will cause blood clots to form. In this case here, we see that 
these little things underneath, these little green things called von Willebrand's factor can get secreted into the lumen and cause blood clots, white blood clots, which are rich in platelets, to form and then finally block the pulmonary vessel. These tiny little clots are too small sometimes to be even seen on x-ray images or CT images or VQ scan images and can only be picked up on autopsy. And there's been several reports that were published early in the pandemic, for instance, in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed that these deaths from COVID-19 had high levels of small clots in them. And that's what causes the hypoxemia. And we actually covered this in Update 67, which was published on May 6th of 2020. We started looking at von Willebrand's factors that were being secreted into the pulmonary circulation. Take a look back on May 6th from the Coronavirus Pandemic Update 67, entitled COVID-19 Blood Clots, Race, Blood Types, and Von Willebrand Factor. Well, there was an article that was published on April 15, 2020 in Thrombosis Research, and it describes a patient who came in and what happened with their coagulation factors. And what it showed was that there was a massive elevation of this von Willebrand factor. And this von Willebrand factor, the antigen was 555% of normal. And the von Willebrand factor was 520% of normal activity when normal is 42 to 168. There were also other factors that were increased, including factor 8 of the coagulation cascade. And even they realize that the increased von Willebrand factor points towards massive endothelial stimulation and damage with release of von Willebrand factor from Weibull palade bodies. Interestingly, endothelial cells express ACE2, the receptor for SARS-CoV-2, thus possibly mediating endothelial cell activation. So you're probably wondering what these Weibull palade bodies are. They're only found in endothelial cells. And these tiny little bodies release these stringy type substances called von Willebrand factor, which allows for coagulation. And it allows platelets and the clot to form together. When there's so much destruction of the endothelial cell, this von Willebrand's factor is released in high concentrations into the blood. Now notice that that patient had a very high von Willebrand factor count. 555% activity, which is very consistent with exactly what we're seeing here with blood clots and the potential mechanism for this. And this has actually been borne out with other studies since that time that patients who are having very severe COVID-19 have high von Willebrand factor activity. And again, at the time, we discussed how one could go from oxidative stress to thrombosis. Watch what we said here. We have SARS-CoV-2 which causes an infection, and that reduces ACE2. And the reduction in ACE2 is going to increase angiotensin 2 and decrease angiotensin 1-7. That together is going to increase oxidative stress with superoxide. That, as we've just talked about, is going to cause endothelial cell dysfunction. Endothelial cell dysfunction leads to an increase in von Willebrand's factor, which eventually leads to thrombosis. So you can see the domino effect here where it goes from one end to the other. If we can somehow mitigate the oxidative effects of COVID-19, we can perhaps mitigate the hypoxemia and actually improve symptoms. Don't forget that it's in patients with the most metabolic symptoms that have the worst outcomes in COVID-19, people with diabetes, hypertension, etc. So it makes sense that they're already kind of behind the curve in terms of oxidative balance, and that if we can improve that, at least acutely, perhaps we can actually make some improvements on these patients. The other aspect of this that is really tantalizing is this article that was published well before the pandemic back in 2007, and it links the ABO group to the amount of von Willebrand's factor that is circulating in the blood. They actually found here that type O individuals have the lowest amount of von Willebrand factor, which might implicate them in terms of having better outcomes. And there's been some debate and some studies that have looked back and forth on this. Some studies have shown that there's no difference between the ABO groups and other studies, especially early on 
on that seemed to indicate that there might be a survival advantage in patients with O-type blood. So again, part of my excitement here is that a lot of things were coming together. So given this mantra of oxidative stress with ACE2 being inhibited by the virus and a misbalance where there is too much angiotensin 2 and too little angiotensin 1-7, one of the ways we have of getting rid of reactive oxygen species is to make sure that we have a good night's sleep, that we're turning off the lights after 9 o'clock at night, and also making sure that we're getting outside to get this near-infrared radiation from the sun, which I believe is very important. The sun giving us melatonin production in our cells, we definitely now know that melatonin beyond a doubt is actually being produced in the mitochondria. The question is, is if it is near-infrared radiation that's stimulating it, what wavelength is it that is doing it? What I can tell you based on this randomized controlled trial is that this vest that has now been introduced here is actually directly causing an improvement in hypoxemia and blood clots. And I believe it's very likely based on all of the data that it's doing it through a mechanism of melatonin reducing reactive oxygen species. But I think more research is needed. And again, the reason why I say that is because of some studies that have been published recently, specifically by Dr. Russell Ryder and Scott Zimmerman in Melatonin Research. And this is what they said in their paper publication that was published back in 2019, even before the pandemic. They said, quote, it has now been shown that the mitochondria produce melatonin in many cells in quantities which are orders of magnitude higher than that produced in the pineal gland. This subcellular melatonin does not necessarily fluctuate with our circadian clock or release into the circulation system, but instead has been proposed to be consumed locally in response to the free radical density within each cell, in particular in response to near-infrared exposure. I just want to show you again the solar radiation spectrum. Again, here is 940 nanometers. This is the wavelength that they used in the jacket studies. Again, what they said is they don't know if 940 is the optimal wavelength. They don't know if a different wavelength would be better or at a higher intensity. All they know is that at that wavelength and that intensity, that was the benefit that they got. It may actually be tuned to a better wavelength. The thing, though, that's interesting about this is that when you go out into the sun, you're going to get all of this near-infrared radiation. And specifically, what's interesting is that, as you can see here in the next slide, if this is the spectrum of the sun that you're getting, if you go into a green space, the amount of near-infrared radiation actually goes up dramatically in the solar spectrum. In other words, people who are living in open spaces surrounded by green are going to be getting more near-infrared radiation than those who are living, for instance, in a city. In fact, if you look at some of these near-infrared photographs, you can see here that the leaves of the trees are practically lit with light when you look at it in the near-infrared spectrum. Here's a photo of Central Park, and you can see that the trees light up, whereas the buildings are fairly dull. So if we look in a comparison between what happened with the jacket in this randomized controlled trial and the sun, we can look at the power calculations. And thanks to Scott Zimmerman, who I talked to personally about this and got these numbers and checked them out with him as well. Here we see that the jacket, in terms of the amount of work that was being done per squared centimeter, was 29 ten thousandths of a watt. Now, if you go out into the sun, you're going to be getting 1,400 ten thousandths of a watt a significantly higher amount. Of course, in the sun, if we look at just the amount that's coming from near-infrared radiation here, that's about 53%. That's the amount of watts per square centimeter of this spectrum from 760 to this should be 1400. Whereas here, there's a significantly less amount. Here we have again 29 ten thousandths of a watt per square centimeter. But here we're just looking at a very small bandwidth. In fact, as it turns out, going into the sun at high noon, you get about 25.6 times more power from the sun in terms of near-infrared radiation than you would from this jacket, which begs the question, would these patients have done just as well going outside into the sun? And I think that's an excellent question. And in fact, there is data that is backing up that supposition, although it's not randomized data, it is case control data. Let's take a look at that real quickly. Here's a study that was published in Scientific Reports in Nature titled Autumn COVID-19 Surge Dates in Europe Correlated to Latitudes, Not to Temperature, Humidity, Pointing to Vitamin D as a Contributing Factor. 
Here they're using vitamin D as a surrogate for sunlight, but I would say that it's the sunlight itself that is helping, and maybe also the vitamin D, but it's not clear. So take a look at this. What they did was they basically looked at the autumn of 2020 and they asked the question in Europe, which country developed the surge first? And then they just mapped it out. And they saw whether or not it correlated with the temperature. And notice that it was essentially flat. That means no correlation with temperature. Then they also mapped it out for humidity. And again, notice it's completely flat. So not related to humidity. However, when they looked at the latitude at what the country was at, here we start with Finland, which is way in the north, and we end up here with Greece, which is way in the south. And there was a almost perfect correlation that, yes, latitude did predict which country was going to have a spike first. And you can see here, Finland here is up in the north, and we have Greece way down here in the south. As you can see going back to that slide, it perfectly predicted as we go down in latitude that that's when we're going to see the peak. And that has a lot to do with sunlight. If we look at ultraviolet A radiation and COVID-19 deaths in the United States and England and Italy, what they decided to do here was look to see whether or not sun exposure itself could predict COVID-19 mortality. And so what they did with the USA is they blocked out anywhere in the U.S. where vitamin D could be obtained in the wintertime and looked at everything else. And they noticed that in terms of COVID-19 deaths per million, it was higher in those areas where there was less sunlight. And it was lower in areas where there was more sunlight, even though there was no vitamin D being produced. They also predicted this for England, and they found the same. Higher mortality in the higher aspects or the higher latitudes, lower mortality in the lower latitudes. They also predicted this for Italy, and exactly the same thing happened. In fact, it was so interesting that the authors said in the journal, quote, in conclusion, the study is observational, and therefore any causal interpretation needs to be taken with caution. However, if the relationship identified proves to be causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention, given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway. It suggests possible new COVID-19 therapies, and I think they were absolutely right. I was happy to team up with Dr. Margaret Scutch out of the National University in Mexico, and we looked at COVID-19 death rates around the globe. This was published recently in Melatonin Research, titled A Geographical Approach to the Development of Hypotheses Related to COVID-19 Death Rates. We looked at those with high BMIs. This group of countries here at the top had high BMIs. These down here had low BMIs. And then we looked at the COVID deaths per million. And what we found in countries with high BMIs had COVID-19 death rates that correlated with latitude. In other words, the higher the latitude, the higher the mortality. And I think that goes along with the data that we've already seen. And of course, with all of these studies, we'll put a link in the description below. So the thing in researching this and looking back at this, this is nothing new. So there have been a number of scientists that have looked at the sun and have determined that based on empirical data, there is improvement in outcomes, not the least of which is John Harvey Kellogg. And he wrote this back in the 1800s. He said, heliotherapy or the use of sunlight as a curative means is one of the oldest of natural healing agents. It is only within the last 20 years, however, that the physiological and therapeutic effects of light derived from natural and artificial sources have been made the subject of careful scientific study. Within this period, numerous investigators have devoted themselves to the study of this subject, and the extended researches that have been made have resulted in the development of a new class of therapeutic methods, principles, and measures which constitute the science of phototherapy. So you have to remember that this was the cutting edge technology back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. It wasn't until 1928 with the discovery of penicillin that we started to look down the road of randomized controlled trials for medications. And so when we're talking about the 1918 pandemic, there was a student of John Harvey Kellogg by the name of Wells A. Rubel, who was the medical director of the New England Sanitarium in Boston. And this was an article that he published back in May 1st of 1919, titled, As We See It in Life and Health. He says, the present epidemic of influenza has furnished excellent opportunity to test out the efficacy of rational treatment in dealing with respiratory disorders, especially in conditions accompanying and following attacks of influenza. What was the rational treatment that Dr. Wells Rubel was employing in his sanitarium? It was basically rest, it was hydrotherapy, which we've talked about before, and it was getting plenty of sunshine and fresh air. He wrote up his findings in that article, 
where he showed that compared to the army hospitals, which early on had a 16% mortality rate, he only had a 2% mortality rate. Once the patients developed pneumonia, which for those in the army hospitals was not a small amount, there was a 40% mortality rate, whereas in the sanitariums, only a minority of the patients developed pneumonia, and they had a pretty severe late infection fatality ratio. So that totally, the infection fatality ratio in the army hospitals was 6.4%, in the sanitariums was 1.1%. This has been something that has been looked at before, and I think we're just starting to now understand why they started to have better outcomes when patients were exposed to near-infrared radiation. This has been well-known, and it has been researched, and it has been demonstrated that sunlight improves outcomes, especially in these viral syndromes. In fact, so much so that a notable health reformer at the time wrote in May of 1871, the feeble one should press out into the sunshine as earnestly and naturally as do the shaded plants and vines. The pale and sickly grain blade that has struggled up out of the cold of early spring puts out the natural and healthy deep green after enjoying for a few days the health and life-giving rays of the sun. Go out into the light and warmth of the glorious sun, you pale and sickly ones, and share with vegetation its life-giving, health-dealing power. Notice and remember that getting near-infrared radiation from the sun is important in terms of reducing reactive oxygen species, but also making sure that you're getting enough melatonin at night from the pineal gland. And one of the things that can shut that down pretty quickly is by exposing your eyes to bright light after 9 o'clock at night. Well, notice what this health reformer also says in addition to going out into the sun is, quote, make it a habit not to sit up after 9 o'clock. Every light should be extinguished. This turning night into day is a wretched, health-destroying habit. I believe that we ought to be really encouraging the exposure of near-infrared radiation to not only us as individuals, but also to our patients in some way, shape, or form. And it's becoming increasingly difficult. Let me explain why that's the case. It's because, whereas back in the 1800s, we got plenty of near-infrared radiation, Today, we are getting a paucity, and the reason for this is three reasons. Number one is we don't go outside as much as we used to, number one. Number two, the lighting that we use inside is devoid of near-infrared radiation, and it's on purpose that this is the case because near-infrared radiation is not visible, and therefore its generation is seen to be wasteful of energy. And that's why these LED lights, the lights that we put in our homes, not the ones in the jacket which are designed for near-infrared radiation, but the LED lights in our homes have no near-infrared for red radiation whatsoever, as I'll show you. The third and last reason is because of low e-glass windows. And these are windows that are put in homes that are specifically designed to block near-infrared radiation from coming into the home because that type of radiation would heat the home and therefore would increase costs of cooling. So let me show you the LED light. So the first thing I want to show you is what the sun is emitting, and that's this orange-yellow line. And then I want to show you what our old-fashioned incandescent light bulbs that we used to have in our homes do. And you can see here clearly that there's plenty of near-infrared radiation. In fact, the majority of the energy is in the near-infrared radiation. This is the portion of the light bulb that is emitting visible light, the old-fashioned light bulbs. Now let's look at a 3000K LED. All of the energy is being utilized specifically and only for visible light. There is absolutely no near-infrared radiation coming from that bulb. Let's look at glass. This is coming from the U.S. Department of Energy. Notice that clear glass that we would have back in the 1950s and 60s, obviously it is able to transmit visible light, but it's also able to transmit near-infrared light very easily. You can tell this by simply standing in front of that window, and if you feel the warmth of the sun hitting you through that window, then you know you've got just good old-fashioned regular glass. But notice here that low E glass, and specifically high solar, moderate solar, and low solar E gain, basically is going to be dropping in increments the amount of near-infrared radiation that's coming through. We can say that in the grand scheme of things inside of your cells, if you want to improve the situation with reactive oxygen species, obviously you need to make sure that you're being treated for diabetes, obesity, all of these things that lead to that. But if you're having a situation where you've got SARS-CoV-2, you're worried about COVID-19, we need to do everything possible to make sure that you're getting enough near-infrared radiation to mitigate, potentially through the mechanism of melatonin, the effects of reactive oxygen species. Certainly, we know very well that getting good sleep 
and melatonin through that process is important, but also it would appear that getting plenty of regular sunlight, or if you're able to, and you can't get sunlight and you're in a hospital, getting near infrared radiation in some other means is gonna be really important as well. What do we do about this information? First of all, I am a critical care physician. I treat patients all the time with medications. I believe that the COVID-19 vaccines are effective at preventing COVID-19, but nothing is 100%. I myself am vaccinated. My family members are vaccinated, but I am all too aware that vaccines do not work 100% of the time. So I'm not looking for other entities to use instead of vaccines. What I'm saying here is that this can be used in addition to, and here's the benefit that this has that the other things may not. So medications, vaccines, all of these things, they need a supply chain. You need to be able to ship these things. You need to be able to store these things. You need to be able to administer these things. You need a pharmacist. You need a blood test, etc. If we're talking about sunlight, you don't need that. These are things that if people are educated to do, they can do this. You can scale it up immediately. The sun is free. And near-infrared radiation can penetrate through clouds. Even on a cloudy day, it can penetrate through clothes. It can penetrate through your hat. You don't need to be in direct sunlight to get the benefits of near-infrared radiation. Because of the scalability, because of the ability to use this epidemiologically in pandemics when you cannot get enough medications out for everybody, I feel it's really important that people understand this information. Getting outside and obtaining as much sunlight as possible, especially during the winter months, is going to be key. The data is showing this is the reason why these viruses are so prevalent in the winter time. It's because we're not getting enough near-infrared radiation. This is especially true for people who are sick. If you're sick, making sure that you're not kept inside away from the sun is extremely important. And yes, there were times during the pandemic where people were shut in and there were times where people were not allowed to go outside. I think it's important to balance the epidemiological and the isolation from also getting outside and making sure you're getting appropriate sunlight and fresh air. I think we do need to do more randomized controlled studies. I think the one that we showed here in this video is important. I think 30 is a good number. It's a pilot study, but I think we need to do more and it needs to be bigger. I don't think we need to wait for more of these studies though before telling ourselves as individuals to get outside into the light. Lastly, consider this therapy from a public health standpoint, especially during surges where medications are not available to everyone. It should be a not. If truly near-infrared radiation, as was demonstrated in this randomized controlled trial with the jacket, can improve outcomes, then why wouldn't it work if it was coming from the sun? What we're seeing here in these studies is a strong indication that what we need to be doing is changing our behavior and getting outside more often. I really hope that you share this video with as many people as possible because I think the data is there and the science is there and what we need to do is to convince people that this is what we need to be doing. I would like to see personally hospitals being built of a different order where they are built with patients that can go outside and they can get sunlight and they have rooms that are filled with light. There's actually data that shows that this works, that patients who are closer to the window are discharged more quickly than their room partners that are not as close to the window. So with that, don't forget to support us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.